Better late than never. Not even an introduction because I didn't have power for three hours this afternoon and I made us late. It's fine, man. Things happen. It's life. Well, it that's is. why Clarence was thinking about He-Man because um, now you have the power. power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good one. <laughs> yep. That was exactly what I was going for whenever I yeah. typed that in. So, so let, <laughs> let me re- explain the reference real quick. Uh, in the latest uh, Masters of the Universe revelation on Netflix, uh, there's a character. Of course, you have Skeletor, Skeletor, but you have his alter ego or his former self, Randor, I Randor. believe, if I'm, yeah. if I'm getting it right. But uh, Skeletor, of course, was voiced by Mark Hamill. And Randor, Kiltor, Kiltor, sorry. Kiltor, voiced by William Shatner. So, of course, really? it was freaking me out about as I was watching this. And I'm sorry to derail the podcast. For you. <laughs> no. De- 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 consider us railed and derailed. I'm the one who started the whole thing with saying, I have the power. Oh, wow. <laughs> William Shatner, who, by the way, is 93 as of last week. And looks mm. great for his age. And looking great. It's yes. amazing what that mad cow disease can do. Exactly. <laughs> Denny Gray. Or going to space, which, whichever way you want to. Yeah. Know. Hey, if, if, if I can look uh, that good at, what did you say, 93? 93. Then send me to space any day of the week. Yeah. Actually, go there ahead were, and send me to space. <laughs> there were four of them in that privately funded spaceship. I really thought they'd come back with superpowers. <laughs> mm. Well, you know. <laughs> All I can say is the I, fact that they didn't, just what a revolting revelation that was. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, I know we are like literally an hour late to the party. So I say with yeah. that, let's say, as we always say, here we go again. The Discussing Network presents Discussing Who, a Doctor Who podcast. I'm Kyle Jones, and I want to start this episode by welcoming back Lee Shackelford. Lee, how are you? I'm grand, and I'm glad that we're I'm glad that we're doing this. We we did get off to a late start, but time, as we know, and relative dimensions are relative. In so spa- in space. And in who space. Makes up the rest of our space for the this happy, happy trio of speakers. <laughs> Clarence Brown. Mr. Brown, how are you? I'm doing great, man. A bit tardy for the party, but, you know, Ooh. glad to be here nonetheless. Indeed, indeed. Well, <laughs> glad that we're here. Also, hello, Win Grace in the chat. And if, what I mean by chat, if you have been listening to us recently, you will hear us refer to the chat because we are now streaming on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook, as well, I think we still do Twitter. I'm going to call it Twitter. It's still Twitter to me, our recording. So <laughs> I'm not going to X that. I'm going to say it's Twitter, even though I don't go on it much. But um, just hello and welcome, everybody. I will go ahead and apologize for anyone listening or watching My brain is a little disgruntled and discombobulated because, as I said before we started recording, I lost power this afternoon during my assigned prep time, so I'm literally winging it. So, that being said, Lee, there is something you like telling everyone at the beginning of, or at the end, or whenever Kyle remembers to say it, (laughs) what do you like telling people who may not have ever listened or watched us before? I always like to say, welcome aboard. We know you've got other things you could be doing, and you've chosen, for whatever reason, brain damage, whatever, to uh, (laughs) spend this time. But I hope it's because you've heard that we are, I like to think that, that, uh, because there's 6,000 Doctor Who discussion podcasts out there. That more or less. And uh, we, we like to distinguish ourselves as being the ones with the positive outlook. So uh, if you like that, maybe that's why you're here. And uh, we hope we do not disappoint anyway. Awesome. And Clarence, if there are anyone listening who have never subscribed or who are new, what do you like telling everyone? Yes, my call to action for you guys, if you're new to... Since we're streaming, I'm going to say first go to our YouTube channel, which is Discussing Mm. Network on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. 
And also, whatever podcast catcher player that you're currently listening in, make sure you subscribe there as well so you don't miss an episode. And if you have anything you want us to know, you can send it in to discussingwho at gmail.com or hit us up at discussingwho on any and all social media, including X. Including the the, (laughs) the artist formerly known as Twitter. (laughs) All righty then. So I will say that uh, when Grace in the chat uh, again, and speaking of YouTube, if you are on YouTube, go check out when Grace's channel and also give him a sub- subscribe as well. He did say in regards to our tardiness, the doctor got Rose home a year late an hour is fine. Well said, my friend. Yes. Well said. So I'll tell you something that wasn't late. I think it was just in time. It was something Ooh. that happened this weekend. I hope both of you have seen the Doctor Who 2024 series trailer. Yes. In, in its several versions. So, all right. So what did you think? Oh, it's really exciting. And I think one of the things we're showing off is that uh, I, I'm just speculating based on what we've seen, but we're going to see a different look for the Doctor in every time and place they visit. Mm-hmm. which is a lot of fun. Uh, b- because why not? Why yeah. not? Why? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there you go. All right. Clarence, have you seen it? And if so, what were your thoughts? I've seen it. It looked fantastic. It looked like uh, balls to the wall fun. Mm. Um, looks like they're going to be a lot of play with the dynamics of time, which, you know, this being a time travel show, that's one of my favorite things in Doctor mm-hmm. Who. And when they utilize that cleverly, I think that's Doctor Who at its best. We've even got a, a little thing in the trailer showing butterflies, so to speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's, I think the trailer looked great. And I'm really excited about season one of Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> when Grace asks if we're going to need eight action figures for this season. I'll buy them. Uh, I was going to say, if I was in charge of marketing, the answer would be yes. All right, Indeed. Clarence, speaking of the trailer, I want to transition us just for a second to Star Trek. And if I recall, <laughs> with Strange New Worlds, on the episode of Strange New Worlds in the most recent season, they had a musical episode. And if I recall correctly, you were a fan of that, right? You think it was pulled off well? I think it was, but I don't want to see that again in Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we got enough of it already with the the, the goblins and the babies. And I, I don't, I don't want any more of it. But are you, are you leading me somewhere with this? I am indeed leading you, and Lee, I think you know where I'm leading, right? Uh, the lads from Liverpool. Yes, indeed. I think the Beatles episode will be a musical oh, episode. I. Oh. Hmm. Ooh. No, I hope not, because I, I want them to be them and. For the doctor and his companion to be them. All right. So with that said, explain. So let's let's try to, in context, put Mm. the scene where you see this this um, these people that are dancing in the water, and then you Mm. see the doctor in a sound booth, Mm -hmm. and it's he's in that 1960s garb that he's wearing, and Mm -hmm. he is all into the music and. So are the people surrounding him. Now, Mm -hmm. that could literally be just choreographed or spliced or just so that he's listening to them sing and everybody and he's, you know, into the music that he's listening to. Yeah, the the editing more suggested that to me. Okay. And that they're excited to be going to Abbey Road in, you know, in 1970. And uh, so... Gotcha. We're yeah. we're gonna look in on the Beatles, you know. That that's gonna be a hard thing right. to pull off. <laughs> it, could, it could go either way. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I am one of the best visuals that I saw throughout the trailer, which there were many, but the one that fascinated me the most was using musical bars and musical notes as a means to entrap someone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was it was it a uh, 
uh, Ruby Sunday with the yes. notes yes. trapped around her. That was yeah. that was pretty cool. Reminded me a little bit of the Doctor Strange, the last Doctor Strange. Indeed, movie. very much. So. Yeah, and it made me think of Fear Her. So, um, <laughs> sorry to be the downer there, but I I just said, oh, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. In the chat, Wingrace asks, "Is the Yellow Submarine a TARDIS?" Um, in, in the George Dunning film, uh, the yellow submarine is much, much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So, <laughs> you know, you may have something there. And as a callback to the 60th episode with the uh, dancing of the toy maker to the Spice Girls, I remember the Spice Girls bus was allegedly bigger on the inside than it was <laughs> on the outside. So just say I, so one other thing before we move on, I did notice a lot of references to the um, a lot of references to supernatural. And they even we hear Kate Stewart reference that things are getting supernatural more and mm -hmm. more. Thoughts about going more supernatural in Doctor Who? I know we've had discussions about that in the past, but what are your thoughts about getting into this more acknowledged supernatural element? Uh, to me, it seems like whenever there's supernatural in Doctor Who, it always leads to science in some way. Now, there are a lot of exceptions as well, but but that's usually the goal for me when there's something that seems supernatural, that it leads to science. So if there's going to be a lot of it in the upcoming season, I, I'm interested in how they're going to explain it all, <laughs> or if they're even going to attempt to explain it, so... Yeah, could be could be interesting. Okay. Yeah, same. I think if they're if they're genuinely supernatural, then it breaks one of the fundamental rules of the show. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah. If there's if if Odin appears in the sky, it's a hologram. If there are ghosts visiting you, including one of the Doctor, it's a hologram. If you know, if there's a mummy on the Orient Express, yeah, it's it's not a mummy. It's yeah, we're we're, we're going to find out. It's. So, so, Lee, you worded that perfectly. Hmm. You said, if this is basically, I think you said, if this is true, it breaks one of the fundamental... Ten, rules of the I, show, I believe. Yeah. The show. yeah. What if, then, the doctor himself <clears throat> is who broke one of the fundamental rules of the show in Wild Blue Yonder? Right. That, that would be what would make it possible, wouldn't it? Yes, uh. indeed. But but see, I mean, in a sense, but it's like <clears throat> we're really crossing the streams tonight because what that makes me think of is the Encyclopedia of the Marvel Universe. Do you do you know this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that, that 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 spilled a lot of uh, writers' room secrets uh, from uh, from Marvel Comics back in the day. And one of the the things that you notice throughout that is that we are always drawing on energy and material from another universe. Mm -hmm. That's that's something that Reed Richards figured out, and so he was able to make unstable molecules, whatever the hell that is, and uh, things like that. So uh, Johnny's, Johnny Storm's uh, fire is actually a, an energy that's coming from another universe, and so that kind of thing. Uh, the, <clears throat> so our supers are just people who are able to, to manage that. And even if you're called a witch you're still managing energy that is coming from another. There's a scientific explanation, mm. in other words. There are no flat-out ghosts in the Marvel Universe, and I think this works in Doctor Who, too. What happened with the toy maker was that he lives in a separate reality that has laws of physics of its own, and the Doctor did something that, in, that violated the rules of our universe enough to allow the toy maker to come and inhabit our universe. Mm. Uh, it's still a scientific explanation. Mm. I'm you good know, with he, that. I, yeah. You know, I'm going to trust RTD. I loved the long game before, and, you know, I'm loving the long game <clears throat> here. So, enough on the trailer. Let's go ahead and <laughs> move into the reason we are here the Zygon inversion. So, for everyone listening or watching, if you have not seen the Zygon inversion, Put us on pause, go out, watch the episode, come back, because from this moment forward, spoilers. 
Alrighty, the spoiler warning has gone out, and we are back to review the Zygon Inversion. This is the eighth episode of the 2015 series of Doctor Who, first airing on the 7th of November, 2015. It starred Peter Capaldi as the 12th Doctor and Jenna Coleman as Clara Oswald. So, summary view, Clarence Brown, I'll start with you. Summary view, what say ye? Overall, I think I enjoyed it. Uh, I think you come to this episode for number one, Jenna Coleman as as evil Clara. I thought it was excellent. Uh, But I think it did meander a little bit. Um, To me, they kind of stretched it out to make it this this two parter. Um, But but I think all of that is worth it once you get to the doctor's plea and near the end of the episode. But it did meander just a little bit to me. All right. Lee, what say you? What do you think? I, I'm with Clarence uh, right down the road. It's um, it, it seems like it's um, it just has a lot that we have to try to do, and the result of that is it seems like it's kind of all over the place. And then we hunker down and we talk, and we talk for kind of a long time. Um, and I I got nothing but favorite quotes from this episode. I, I can't decide from all the quotes. I mean, there's so many great things that people say. But um, as an action-adventure format, yeah, we just slammed the brakes on and we just talked. And, uh, you know, I, and I say that as a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation, a show in which they would routinely say, we're in big trouble. Let's all go sit around a table and talk about it. <laughs> um, and it was okay, you know. Um, so I, I'm I'm not that's I'm not dissing that I'm just saying this is a fact this is an episode that we're going to have to if there's a solution if there's a way out we're going to have to slow down and talk about it mm. so that's you know for better or for worse that's what goes on here so for me I remember last episode was a hard watch for me because I th- I think I were even referenced or referred to the episode as falling into the trap of the part one of a two-part story because I felt it was very slow Mm. and it was nothing but set up for the next episode. And I think that can sometimes be good and sometimes be bad. This one, I actually didn't get bored in. Maybe I Mm. got bored enough in the previous episode that all of my bored quota (laughs) was used up in the previous episode. I really didn't get bored in this one. I actually enjoyed Clara in, in this episode very much. <laughs> what and, does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not the biggest oh, Clara okay. fan. Okay. Um, but I really enjoyed the writing. I didn't really remember some of the things from this episode because I haven't watched anything but the speech in probably 10 years. Hmm. So um, it was almost new to me again. But I did enjoy it. So, Clarence, I want to point that question to you. Let's talk about Clara at the beginning. What did you think of Clara having the ability to influence actions, even though she was in the Zygon pod? Thoughts? Yeah, that whole thing made me think a lot about and I forget the episode title. Was it Dalek? I can't quite remember. But the one where it wasn't this version of Clara that was trapped mm-hmm. in the Dalek. Asylum it, of the Daleks. Yeah, Asylum of the Daleks. Right. It, it, she's... It, yeah, definitely gave me flashbacks of that, having Clara kind of trapped in this pseudo-reality where she can peek out and do these little things to change the course of actions from, from inside is the Zygon's mind. So I think the whole concept of them being linked and having some sort of control if, if they're strong enough to influence to influence the Zygon, I thought that was really interesting uh, to see her kind of break through and, and contribute that way while she was still in the pod. Cool. Lee, what about you? What did you think? Oh, agree, agree. That, that's um, tremendous force of will. And uh, yeah, and you can't not think of Souffle Girl while she's doing it. I think, um, um, 
but yeah, just the presence of mind that she, she knows this is the, she's already been told this is what happens. The Zygons don't kill the people they've replaced. They have to have them. And once she figures out so that's where she is, which is extraordinary in itself, she try she figures out how to use it. Yeah. Uh, and before we know it, she, we, she's got, uh, uh, the Zygon, uh, Clara texting on her phone <laughs> without even realizing it. It's, it's lovely. Mm. You know, oddly enough, I don't, <laughs> I didn't see uh, the reference to the Asylum of the Daleks. And it's so obvious now, but hmm. I did not even get that um, when watching it through. But I did like, as far as character development, again, we refer, referred to how far Clara has come as a character when she was first uh, in the girl who died first interacting with the shielder and going and meeting the fake code and, and, you know, basically being the doctor with half, I, I think Clarence, you said this being the doctor with half of a sonic, uh, you know, the sonic shades. So right. I, I just think for character development, that entire exchange with her and Bonnie was awesome. Absolutely awesome. So lady, I'm going to shift a little bit. What do you think of the concept of the Osgood box? Oh, the way the whole gambit is played, I think, is, is sheer genius. And my note about it was I wrote Mutual Assured Destruction. Yes. I mean, the parallel in the real world is, you know, that's pretty much what has kept us from nuking each other, is that we, it's going to be bad for whoever fires first. So we don't fire first. Um, and that, and we base that on our spy intelligence of each other's weapons. Well, that could be a preposterous number for all we know, but we don't know. Mm. So it works. It's crazy. I mean, it spells M A D <laughs> mutual <laughs> assured destruction. I mean, that, that feels like that can't be a coincidence, but the really mad thing is it's worked since the mid fifties. So here we are. All right. Uh, and, and with, it's not a spoiler to say, you know, if you've seen the episode, right. But I mean, revelation that it's a bluff. It's okay. It, it still works. Yeah. All right. Clarence, what about you? What did you think of the concept of the Osgood box? Uh, every, everything Lee said, uh, I actually love the differences of, what you know was kind of touted as the outcome to both of these these guys mm. at the end. One was blowing up all of London, and the other was how the Zygons would be trapped forever as humans, and who wants that, right? So, and they had a few more things they threw in there as as kind of the opposite sides of of hitting this button. So yeah, I thought it was it was very um, well done, and like Lee said, definitely played upon that kind of Cold War mentality. Did you realize at any point before the revelation, because I did not, I did not remember this, but did you realize before the revelation that the box didn't do anything, that the box didn't do anything, or did you find out along with everyone else? Uh, I, I definitely, I didn't remember it from watching it before, so I found out as the show played out. Um, yeah, it's funny how the threat of what could happen is almost enough to keep you from going over the brink, even when, when there's nothing really on the other side, it's just the, the fear of what could happen that, you know, that we don't want to pursue or don't want to take the risk of. So yeah, just, I think that was the icing on the cake for this kind of going back and back and forth is the, the fact that, you know, nothing's in there. It's just the, the fear of what could happen is what's keeping everybody at bay. So yeah, well played. Lee, what about you? Did you remember or did you, if you didn't remember, work it out that these boxes are empty? I did not. And so I thought that was a pure joy. And, and further, I had misheard the first time they talked about Osgood boxes. And I, th I thought we were flashing back to Stolen Earth and that we were talking about the Osterhagen key again. Ah, okay. Um, which makes me think I need to go back and watch that a set of episodes again because I don't remember is the Osterhagen device still 
Is that still a possibility? It's still a possibility. The doctor tells Martha at the end of in Journey's End, which is the season four or the 2008, no, yeah, 2008 yeah. series of Doctor Who, that he says basically, Martha, get rid of that Osterhagen key. Right. But that's so, the last we hear of it. Yeah. But so, so, yeah, the device that could annihilate the Earth is still there. Yeah. Bingo. All right. Pleasant dreams, everyone. <laughs> pleasant dreams. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the idea of trapping the Zygons and ultimately the Zygons being refugees. Because I know I made reference in the last review that in many ways these Zygons were refugees. They were immigrants and it was paralleling like doctor who sometimes does with things that are going on in the wider context of our reality that said what really stood out to me and this is particularly thinking of bonnie here and the character that she represented to me this week it expanded on when you have a select chosen few who are making the decisions for everyone particularly they're doing what they all caps think is best for everyone all mm. caps thoughts and lee i heard you go hmm thoughts on that well you know um, because i have friends in israel my thoughts are with uh, israel and palestine um, pretty much non-stop these days and uh, as i've mentioned here before all of my friends uh, in israel are are, are horrified by what their government is doing. Um, and it's their sense is that it's a pretty small group of people uh, at the top of the, the ladder there who are, who are responsible for this whole uh, outrage against another, another people. And I, I, so I couldn't help watching this episode and hearing the doctor say, you know, the only thing that, that ends these things is forgiveness. And I thought, how is this going to end in Israel? Who's going to be able to say, well, sorry about all that. It's okay. We forgive you. I, that's going to be really hard. Um, I, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's another one of these things where um, um, history repeats itself. And so it went a fictional um, narrative addresses it, it's going to feel familiar no matter what's going on. So, yeah. Clarence, what do you think? I uh, agree with everything Lee just said. Uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, the doctor makes a point of saying, um, what's your goal to, to Zygella? Zygella. What, what, what's your goal? What, what do you want out of this thing? And she says war. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, you know that that just seems absurd, right? That's what we all were thinking when she said it. Like, is, is mm -hmm. that 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 really your goal? And yeah. then what happens? <laughs> and then then you, as this tyrant leader of this group, you're just gonna fold back into society. You don't think they're co gonna come after you next? So yeah, it, it made a good point of, um, and I think you've made this cal this comment before, Cal, of like even if we were all the same the next year or two we'd figure out how to separate ourselves again. <laughs> it would yeah. be something that would, that would make us different that, that we'd complain about. So uh, I, I think it's just a, a good point in that aspect of saying, you know, slow down, slow down. What do you, what do you really want to get out of this? What's your end game? You know, I enjoyed seeing once again, you know, anytime we see Kate Stewart, I think she's, absolutely awesome i think that's the perfect casting for the child of the brigadier because she has that still the show moment you know she's got that presence about her every time we see her i love the fact that we see her once again just like we did in the day of the doctor we see her on the other side of the table and ready to take up arms and ready to do it and then you know backing down because of the doctor seeing another way that said let's get into the doctor's speech lee 
why don't you go first? The doctor's speech. What do you think? Oh, I wanted to mention something about Kate, if we can right, back we'll up go, there for a second. Let's, go, let's There's, back up. That, that scene where she tells the doctor how she got out of that situation has got two lovely shout-outs to for us to, as fans of the classic series. And one of them I recognized, I remember back when we when I first saw the episode, but one of them I missed until watching this yesterday. But um, we see her shoot that Zygon right in the head. Bam, 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 bam. Um, five rounds rapid, which is what her father always was saying when he was uh, uh, in charge of things. He's always yelling this at uh, Benton and the others. So five rounds rapid. And that is, in fact, the title of uh, Nicholas Courtney's autobiography. Oh, that wow, was that is so the, cool. The, the expression was so associated with his character, with the, the brigadier. But they also mentioned that um, we have a gas that will destroy the Zygons. Yes. And it's called Z67 or Sullivan gas. That embassy. I have to assume that that was, yeah, created at unit by Dr. Harry Sullivan, who was briefly a companion of the doctor. So Harry Sullivan is an imbecile. <laughs> yeah, I... But I, I had missed that it's called Sullivan's Gas, so that's a lovely thing. But, uh, but yeah, to, to answer your question properly, though, the, the, the thing about this episode that seems to have survived in the fandom, it seems to have survived, um, and that people are so often quoting, sometimes out of context, this big speech of the doctors in which he's talking sense, but it's, it's tough stuff. It's, it's hard to listen to because uh, these are... These are really difficult um, truths to be said. I, I, I have heard people compare it to the Sermon on the Mount, and, I, and I, mm. I think that's a fair comparison. It's like, wow, really? Oh, no, no, you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, yeah. That's, gonna, that's not going to be easy, but yeah, you're right. Um, and, um, and, and I love it. I, I, I took several chunks of it out here for my favorite quotes here. <laughs> but... What do you guys think about it? This mm. should we be comparing it to the Sermon on the Mount? Maybe a question to ask. All right, Clarence, what do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I want to call it the Doctor's plea because, um, and it does go on for a while, but throughout the speech, he is unrelenting in his just trying to reach these two and make them come to some sort of conclusion he is I, I give Capaldi a lot of credit here because man he is laying it all out there um, in his tone in his, his, his eagerness I don't know if that's the right way to explain it mm -hmm. but he's, he's pleading pleading doing everything he can to, to get these two on the same page and you know what's, what's funny about the whole thing is that and I didn't think about this till it was over, obviously, but we get the little men in black thing <laughs> mm -hmm. by, by the end of it. Like, why didn't you just do it at the beginning? But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, the the plea was, was, was amazing. I, I loved it. You know, I think, I, and I agree with everything both of you just said per the usual, but the thing that got me most in the speech was at the very end where he basically says, paraphrasing here, it all comes down to people sitting down, both sides sitting down and talking. Mm. You know, no matter what happens, no matter how much of an of atrocities or whatnot, it ends with people sitting down and talking. And that just literally has stuck with me, you know, the whole time since I've seen it from the first time. So... That being said, I thought that that was absolutely great. And let's move on to Osgood one more time and refer to her as the Osgoods again. Bonnie mm -hmm. becomes Osgood. Clarence, thought of Bonnie now becoming the second Osgood again. Of course, it made a lot of sense. It kind of mirrored what we had at the very beginning. Two Osgoods. We don't know which one's the Zygon and which one's the human. They're just Osgood. I thought it was a perfect ending to the whole thing. And to see Bunny make that total turnaround by the end of this, really great. Now, one thing I do have a question about, and I'll throw this back to you guys. Do you think we aggrandized the name Osgood just a little bit too much? 
it was too far. <laughs> the eyes get fucked, and, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's kind of graded on me by the end of this. And I know oh. she's a beloved character, but. Lee, what do you think? <laughs> um, that didn't bother me, but I guess, um, yeah. If this continued, for any, <laughs> we're right on the edge, I guess. It's like, yeah. okay, okay, okay. It is, I, speaking of bookends, I do love that uh, the first time she encountered the Doctor, the 11th Doctor, she just was all speechless. And she said, big fan, big fan. Yeah. And when uh, our Doctor left, his last words to her were, big, big fan. fan. Oh, oh, that yeah. is cold. See, I never it's realized very, that. Yeah, it's very sweet. Um, but I, I... I I guess I'm still thinking back on the 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 the, the speech scene with the um the the doctor the doctor's plea. Um, I wanted to to mention just something. Think about this as an actor. When when you're playing a scene like that, very often you're playing to the camera, or you're talking to you're pretending like the other person you're seeing is there, and that's really hard. But if you're in a two shot like they were setting this up, you actually get to interact with the other actor and you get energy from them. You get, you know, there's a chemistry. There's if things are really clicking. And we've seen that Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman have this terrific chemistry. Something to think about. Peter Capaldi played this scene this incredibly moving scene and his energy is coming from Jenna Coleman, who at this moment is playing a different character. Yes. So the energy that he gets from her is completely different than what he usually gets. And I, I was admiring the fact that she is playing two different characters and she's making them very distinct. True. And then she gets them in, we get to play them so that they're in conflict with each other. They have, you know, they have an argument and it's, it's fabulous. But then my mind was blown when I realized what Peter Capaldi's doing in this scene, this fantastic, mm -hmm. over-the-top emotional scene. He's playing to a Jenna Coleman who's given him something different from what he usually gets. It's, wow. Hats off, Peter. And, yeah. and, you know, to further what you're saying there, if I'm thinking of how it was staged, hmm. if there is a body double there at all, the body double that is the body double is not the Bonnie, I wouldn't imagine, body double it would be the Clara body double over on the other end. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so. being held by Kate. Yeah. 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 They did the great thing with, um, with, with, uh, the, well, the doppelganger of Clara in this episode <laughs> yeah. by having her hands pretty much in her pockets the whole time with this different type of jacket. We'd never really seen Jenna Coleman wear. Mm -hmm. So for the majority of the episode, she's, uh, more in a stiff, position shoulders mm -hmm. upright and these hands in his pocket so it's the body tone is, is is a huge part of just making you almost think it's a totally different character that's right and, and, and she, but i bought it i literally yeah. you yeah. know it, it wasn't oh well she's a cheap imitation she was her own character yeah, yeah. you know that's funny you know so oh, do we want to know they come in by wind grace real quick because i think it's sure. pertinent to to what we're talking about and he says, I wonder how much this speech, this, how this speech wouldn't have played, given, would have played, excuse me, yeah. given any other previous incarnation of the doctor. So how any of the doctors would have, would have portrayed the scene. I don't know if they mm -hmm. would have been as pleading as, as Picaldi, P Picaldi was, excuse me, in this scene, because he was, he was, <laughs> he kept coming back with it um, in such a pleading um almost begging tone to them. And it would be interesting to see how other doctors mm. would play it as well. There's because he got so much screen time as the doctor. I can think of several times when uh, Tom Baker was put in this kind of, that the fourth doctor was put in this kind of situation and got to play that scene. Um, I'm thinking about how in Genesis, the Daleks, he, he, he tries to reason with Davros, which, you know, I think, even that far into that episode, you're saying you are wasting your time. Mm. <laughs> but he tries, you know, he tries this this crazy thing on him. He pleads with him. He says, what if you had a capsule that if you held it in your hand and if you broke it, it would destroy everybody in the universe? You know, I think he's drawing a, you know, a comparison to what the Daleks are going to be like in the future. And to his astonishment, yeah. of course, Davros says, I'd do it. <laughs> like, okay, that's not where I thought that was going, but... Uh, yeah. You know who I, I was sitting here in my mind going through incarnations thinking, 
you know, tenant would sound like this, you know, um, 11 would sound like this. Mm -hmm. I even was thinking 15 would sound like this, but then I came (laughs) to who I would love to hear do this speech. I would love to hear the eighth doctor do this speech. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think he could do a great version of the impassioned pleading where Mm -hmm. the others I think would have a tinge a little bit more of anger. Mm -hmm. I think eight could pull off the plead. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think six would make it sound like this is your fault. Yes. (laughs) Six would be a tirade. Right. And And five even. Are you through yet? I think five would make it sound like it's your fault. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So any other items before we move on to our favorites from either of you? Yeah, I have a few. Uh, first, I will say we learned the doctor's name in this episode. Yes. That's is right. It his... <laughs> Basil? Is his really? first name is Basil? I I think not. The doctor lies. Or the makes jokes. Which are... <laughs> right. But I do believe that Osgood's name is Petronella. Mm. Mm. I, I don't think she's playing back. I think that's probably true. Yeah. I thought that was a test, kind of to the doctor trying to figure out is she really eyes good that's how i took it mm. oh that he know he already knows what her name is yes yes yeah all right it, keep going it, and, and we also learned that they've been through this exercise 15 times apparently <laughs> right they kept doing it until they got it right right yeah we're going to get a call back to that and uh um the heaven hell bent and heaven sent right yes. mm. <laughs> haven't we done this before yeah and finally on my list i have that we learned the true acronym is that the abbreviated acronym for the tardis yes <laughs> totally and radically driving in space right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and he says he made it up so there you go it can mean whatever you think it means all right, Lee, did you have any other items? I do not. I, I just have lots of quotes that I love. What a, <laughs> what a quotable script this is. All right. So since this is a quotable script, favorite quote, Lee Shackelford, I'll start with you. Well, I, I, because there's so many great ones, I thought whichever one I choose, I'm going to be stepping on somebody else's favorite quote or not because there's so many to choose from. But I just, I'm always trying to find the right way to express love in my script writing i always want to you know to find different ways of saying it you know um and this is one of my favorite ever and it comes from this episode when uh clara asked the doctor how you know what it was like thinking she was dead and he says the longest month of my life Mm. well it could only have been five minutes I'll be the judge of time. Mm. Mm. Good stuff. Isn't that great? Okay. You said you had more, Lee Shackelford. Give us another one. Oh, my goodness. Um, Come on. You don't invade planets without having some kind of a plan. That's why they're called planets, to remind you to plan it. (laughs) Hey, that's good. Puntastic. Dr. Puntastic. Come on. That was a good one, Zygella. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> and since I didn't have power for three hours and didn't write down anything, that's my favorite quote. There you go. <laughs> to remind you to plan it. All right. And since I didn't get to plan it, Clarence Brown, favorite quote. Do you know what thinking is? It's just a fancy way of changing your mind. I'm not changing my mind. Then you'll die stupid. Die stupid. <laughs> yep. That was on my list as well, yeah. Then you will die stupid. Mm. Oh, All right. Boy. Favorite scene, and I'll start this. I love the speech. It's by hands down my favorite speech. It's one of my 12, or 12th doctor moments. So for me, the plead scene, that's, you know, that speech, that's my favorite scene. So Clarence, favorite scene. I'm right there with you, man. The Doctor's Plea. That's that's by far my favorite scene of, of the episode. All right, Lee. 
I really admired um, Jenna Louise uh, playing that scene in what we think is her her apartment, her home. But there's no way out. And her discovering bit by bit that she's trapped inside her own place. That I, I believe that completely. That was her in a state of mounting panic because something's not real. And then figuring out what's going on. And you see it all in her head. It's just... There's not a word spoken. Like, wow. Yes. Thank you. I just I just admired that little moment so much, my favorite scene. And speaking so. of that particular scene, kudos to the props department for yeah. a very, very, very good job of accurately recreating that apartment that we've seen before mm -hmm. that she had when she and Danny were together. And I'm assuming it's the same apartment that she's in now or flat i should say as she's in now but kudos to them for other than being not being able to see out the windows and doors and whatnot kudos to the props department oh can i really quick add i forget the line that preceded it but there was a moment when um wow well, what was your name zygella zygella <laughs> bunny zygella bunny bunny that's it Bunny said that, um, how do you know what I'm thinking? And the doctor said, I, I know that face. I was like, such a great oh, moment. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the longer you wear it, the more you're like her you're going to be. I can't remember Bunny. Why? Bunny? That's such a Bunny, weird yeah. Move. I will never remember that. Oh, we remember Zygella, though. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. every time I say Bonnie, I think of our friend Bonnie Brantley <laughs> from Oz yes. 9. And I'm exactly. thinking, Bonnie Brantley doesn't have an evil bone in her body. No. Why I keep saying evil, exactly. uh, no. uh, evil Bonnie. But no, anyway. she doesn't. All right. Final rating. Lee, I'll start with you. Final rating. I did feel like it slows down in places where it needed to speed up. But, you know, uh, it's, it's still a... a, a Terrific episode, so I'm giving it four asthma inhalers out of five. Okay. Clarence Brown, final rating. I'm bumping this up because of the speech, so I'm going <laughs> to give it 3.75 rocket launchers Yeah, out of five. All right. I'm going to give it, give it a four, and four, Kyle's brain is dying because he didn't have power and he is now later than normal out of five but so, you have the power you have, I the, have power. the power you have the power <laughs> yes 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 indeed so four i think i just said so yes four all right gentlemen anything else and clarence i'll let you start first anything you've been watching or anything you would like to plug before we get out of here Oh, anything I've been watching, uh, just ready for the next season of Star Trek. So if you're into that, you can hmm. check us out at DiscussingTrek.com. We'll be talking about the fifth and final season of Star Trek Discovery. All right. Ooh. Lee Shackelford. What about Ooh. you? Nope. Nope. Uh. I'm just hanging in there, man. Just hanging in there. All right. I think you've been hanging in there, and I just want to plug this because i can't wait to see this at some point in the future mandeberg train magdeberg magdeberg i always say it wrong well magdeberg. in our meeting with it with one of the itv heads the other day he said you know changing the title is a possibility because nobody can say magdeberg and you know i because i've learned to keep a civil tongue in my head when i'm talking to big studio heads i didn't say yeah imagine calling a film something like oppenheimer but <laughs> it's, it's no time for being a smart ass is it um yeah but anyway m-a-g-d-e-b-u-r-g train.com look it up magdeburg train anyway it, we are we are in the the, th the passionate throes of getting this uh, first episode to ITV. And uh, it's, it's been exhausting and it's been thrilling. And um, yeah, I, I, I was in a Zoom today with another survivor from the train. She's 98 mm. oh, wow. and, and active and sharp as a tack and plays the cello professionally. This, I, yeah, 
Th these people are miracles. They're just, mm -hmm. anyway, MagdaBergTrain.com. Check it out. All right. And speaking of, of being sharp as a tack, and not because she's 98, <laughs> because she's definitely not 98, but she is as sharp as a tack because she <laughs> writes the Oz9 podcast, and we need to oh. get her back on here soon. Shannon yes, Perry. we need Shannon. We need Shannon back very, very soon. But if you like sci-fi and you've heard us talk before about the Oz9 podcast, check us out at oz-9.com. And with that, as always, we will be back next time.